Okay, so that's us all done with our cheeky little triple header we've had thrown in there for us. We've been to Motegi, Japan. Great country, great circuit. And it's thrown up an absolute stinker of a race. <laughs> the Grand Prix on Sunday was a bit dull, wasn't it? So the critics will be out. The critics will be out there talking about the um, ride height devices and things like that. I, I, I get it. I get it. I do get it. It was poor. It was a poor Grand Prix, that one. But it still had a touch of story to it, didn't it? Uh, and the main story, I think, people are going to take out of the weekend, more so even than um, Peko's double victory, which brings the title race back into big contention, is Pedro Acosta. People are going to be talking. The story of the weekend is probably Pedro Acosta. What, sixth in the World Championship or something like that? Uh, and that's what we're going to start by talking about this weekend. As always, in these Grand Prix wrap-ups, everything will be chaptered below. You'll be able to skip ahead to your chosen topic or whatever it is that you want to hear about today. So, starting with Pedro. I mean, we'll talk about Peko a little bit in this as well, because the only real threat to Peko this weekend was Pedro Costa. And I'm sure Jorge Martin was sitting there thinking to himself, mate, like, what are you doing? You you were my chance this weekend to sort of take points off him. Now, there was about four laps ago, I think, when he crashed in the sprint, and he pulled a decent little gap. I don't think Peko would have had a chance to to close that gap up. I think I think that was... That had been won. I think he'd won that race. I think it was over. But obviously to be in that position where he'd opened up that gap and made it beyond reasonable for sort of Peko to chase him down was probably because he was pushing so hard and he was thinking, I'm just going to push this way through to the end. It didn't work out for him in the end. Yeah, just your textbook kind of um, loss of the front into turn seven or whatever it was. Yeah, so disappointing uh, to see Pedro go down. I mean, I was rooting for him the whole weekend there and uh, again on Sunday. And then... We did see again on Sunday, he'd gone into second position. And again, was he the only man that could challenge Peko this weekend? It seemed like it. And it seems like we may have got that battle we've been craving, even though it wasn't between our title contenders, it would have been between Peko and Pedro. And I think Pedro, if he forced the issue, if he got himself into a battle with Peko, with how much Peko has to lose, he's almost going to have to be like, look, I can't take as many risks as you, you know. There was a real chance for him this weekend. To, I mean, to walk away with 37 points, couldn't he? Or at least... Over 30 points. Look, not that that really matters for him. A fifth, sixth in the World Championship, who gives a shit, right? So from that aspect, yeah, whatever. But he was looking for race wins here and he didn't get them. And God, I was disappointed. <laughs> I was so disappointed to see him not win it. So yeah, but he had a, he was, he was absolutely brilliant. You love to see it. He didn't last long in the Grand Prix on Sunday. So you don't really know if he really had the pace to go on and challenge. But I mean, if Martin could finish, well, at one point it was within a second with not many laps to go. He ended up dropping back a bit. But if he could have been that close with the pace he had all weekend, then there's no doubt Pedro could have been challenging for the win because he had more pace than uh, Martin. And I'll say the pass on Banyaya on Saturday, the pass on Banyaya on Saturday was so, so good. Like pure straight out of the textbook, how to overtake on a MotoGP bike. Was not even, didn't get the run out to get level going into the, when they hit the brakes. But, and, and you don't see this very often. You do not see this very often. As they jump on the brakes, he's pulling alongside and gaining time on uh, Peko, and then gets a pulled up, stopped mid corner. Doesn't miss the apex. It was absolutely perfect, perfect way to take the race lead. Unfortunately, didn't result in a win for him. But yeah, I thought he, I thought he was excellent. And and that leads actually, we'll go before we get to Peko as well. We'll, we'll this will lead us into KTM. Big improvement this weekend across. Well, three of the riders. I was going to say all the riders. Poor Augusto, just still not finding it. And actually said in an interview, I was watching the, the rider parade thing where they interviewed the guys before the race and all that. And, you know, the interview with him was almost sad to watch. Just like, are you enjoying your weekend or are you enjoying being in Japan? He was like, no. Nah. And then he obviously wanted to say, you know, just, nah. <laughs> no, no. Went on to say that, like, nothing to do with the country and the people. He loves the country and stuff. But his weekend was going horribly and he wasn't enjoying it so tough times for him but everyone else marked improvement even you know jack didn't qualify well but got off the line beautifully in both races and really got himself up there to the point where he's gone past mark marquez in the grand prix at one point and obviously fell back like he he does have that habit he falls back during the grand prix can't maintain the pace which at this stage fine whatever so he did fall back a bit throughout the race but in both races really showed some fight showed some pace which will be encouraging for him and for KTM, was generally good. I thought he had a good weekend. Uh, and Brad, excellent. Uh, you know, I, there was a bit of a question mark over Brad after the last however many races. 
but showed showed quality again. But again, the the worrying thing for him personally on a personal level was that when all the KTM's and look, it may have been a good KTM circuit, the stop start nature of it, I guess in a lot of the corners, does that help them back in the bike in and firing it out? Probably a little bit. There are some corners that flow, but there are certainly those, you know, make a V type corners that you've got. So maybe the circuit suited them. Maybe it won't be there for, for him at Phillip Island where it flows a lot more and it's a lot more about, you know, high corner speeds and things. But you take your positives there. Brad was very good. Not as good as Pedro, but, you know, Pedro didn't finish the races. So Brad will go, yeah, that's because I wasn't going that quick because I wanted to finish maybe, you know. So, and then he obviously had his issue. I actually don't know to this stage what that was. I must have missed that in the post-race stuff, uh, what the issue was with his bike on Saturday that caused him to not finish the race. But he was certainly up there, certainly up there. And they'll be encouraged by that KTM. Better get on to the guy who actually won the Grand Prix and close the gap in the World Championship fight. Double win, maximum points on a weekend that I'm sure he would have been confident of producing good results this weekend. He is good at Motegi. The potential was there for him, but with the pace of Pedro, it could have easily been two second places this weekend, which is still good for him, but he does, you know, as we run into, you know, the end of the season and you don't know who's going to be good where, he needs to pick up maximum points wherever he can. And, And you could argue he got a little bit lucky with that this weekend, but he still had to go and do the job and he did. He was excellent on Sunday, better on Sunday than he was on Sunday. So that leads me to think maybe if he did, if Pedro did stay on and he did end up in a bit of a scrap with Pedro, could he have seen him off? Potentially. But 10 points now as we head to Phillip Island. I actually don't know what to expect at the island. I mean, I'm racking my brain to see who's good there. But the thing about Phillip Island is it always throws up something weird. You always get a strange result. You, You go back to all sorts of things can happen. The weather can play a part. You get weird shit. You know, Marquez that year that he didn't pit on the... They had to pit. Does anyone remember that? They they had There was a mandatory pit stop that year because I w- had issues with the tyres. And Mark didn't pit in the window and got disqualified. And then there's years where Shinya Nakano's on the front row on a Kawasaki. And, you know, that crazy race where Melandri won in 06 for Grassini. You know, and he's gone around headbutting seagulls. You don't know what's going to happen at Phillip Island. So you could get there. There was... Was there... Do I remember one at Phillip Island where... Davizioso is right in the title hunt and finishes like 12th or something that week. You don't know what you're going to get. So where there's Grand Prix where you think I'm on it this weekend, for him to be able to maximize the points when he potentially may not have done is massive, I think. Massive. Equally big is Martin being able to turn up on Sunday here and go second and minimize the damage. Very important. This one really could have got away from him. If he had another fourth, fifth, or every sixth, or wherever he finished in the sprint, we could be right back to level pegging right now. And he's, he's saved himself a little bit there. And, and did what he could. You know, I was impressed with him this weekend. And just on the broader space, and I've made my feelings clear about sprint races here uh, on the channel in the past. Whilst I enjoy watching them, you know, my stance is that I, I enjoy watching the races. I'm glad there's more racing. It makes the Saturday a bit more entertaining. But for me, as a purist, <laughs> you know, I call myself a purist, and someone who's been watching, you know, from pre racing, you know, my whole life, basically, seeing. Pecco go on and win half of the Grand Prix this season. Half. Eight out of 16 he's won. And he's not winning the World Championship. The other guys, only, the, the other eight races have been split between four other guys. You know, Martin has three wins. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be able to go and win a championship off two or three wins because we've seen it happen before. Nicky Hayden did it, what, two wins that season maybe? Mir did it off one win. That year that Hayden won it, if Rossi had gone and won eight, nine, ten races and Hayden had still won the championship off two or three wins, I'd be like, no, no. I don't, I don't, why is that? How? How? Like, it doesn't make sense. So in that aspect, being 10 points down off five extra Grand Prix wins is like, great. But look, it's not for me that. It's just, it's not for me. Yeah, that's just me, a little opinion for you there. So that's it. I mean, there's not much else for me to talk about this weekend. Racing was the racing. The Sunday race was dull. Saturday was okay. Had a bit of drama. Pedro going down out of the lead and all that. And, you know, we all got our hopes up and then it didn't happen. You know, the drama of sport, you know. And that's pretty much it. Now we just got to move on to the All Japan Cup. Talk about the home home race for these bikes. So here we go. Roll the graphic. Land of the Rising Sun. All Japan Cup. How did we do? Zarko's won the All Japan Cup. After making the mistake of all mistakes on Saturday and taking out his teammate at his home Grand Prix, he just can't do it. Came back and won the All Japan Cup this week by finishing 11th on the road, just under a second ahead of Fabio, who comes second. I mean, if you can't win him, come second. That's what we always say. Taka on the All Japan Cup podium. He ran in 13th 
again, less than a second behind Fabio. So decent result for him. Marini fourth. He has been struggling this season. He has been struggling. So to see him 14th on the road in the points, the real life points, real life points for Luca Marini. And, you know, what, a couple of seconds back from Nakagami, maybe two, oh, maybe almost three seconds in the end. That's not too bad because if he's within like five seconds of the next Honda, you're like, well, he's had a good Grand Prix, hasn't he? Rin struggled. Don't know what happened there. 16th on the road behind Ralph Fernandes. Don't know what happened with him either. I, you don't see the little scraps through the field, so you don't know if he's run wide somewhere or whatever, but he's not had a good one. 40 seconds off the lead, five seconds behind Luca Marini. Uh, and then it was Remy Gardner, who what you get from Remy and these is what you get from Remy. He's picked up a point in the Orange Pan Cup, which leaves us in the season standings. Fabio Quattararo still streets ahead. He's first on 118 points now. Johan Zarco's on 71 points. Goes clear of Taka. They were level pegging going into this one. Taka's on 65. Rins goes to 48. Mir, no movement in the points from him. He's on 39. Still, Marini's on 36. So if he keeps DNFing, Marini can catch him a point at a time. Bradle on seven, who points who didn't compete this weekend. And Remy, who stepped in once again for Yamaha, is gone with an extra point to four points. So he's in eighth in the All Japan Cup. Now, Moto2. This was an interesting one. This had a bit of a uh, this had a bit of drama to it. It's good to see. First lap, race gets stopped. The rain starts coming down. If only it started raining just a little bit before the race, we could have declared it a wet race, but we didn't. And what happened then? What happened then? Well, I'd say what ninety percent of the field, eighty-five percent of the field goes on to uh, wet tires to start the race. A few guys see an opportunity with the rain. Now I say it was raining. It wasn't raining much. The track was wet enough to and there was enough rain to call the race off, but it really eased quickly. And it was like that light misty rain, I think, in the end when they went to start the race. And then the track wasn't that wet. I've got to say, when they called the race, maybe some areas you'd see a touch of spray, but there wasn't really much spray at all. It probably was worth a risk on the dries. So a few guys went on the slicks. The rest of the field, all the major challenges, all on the wet tires, it's like one decided they were going wet and no one wanted to be the odd man out or whatever it was. The track was a bit wet and the rain had called the race off. So you assume that you need to restart the race on the wet tyres, but it had eased a little bit. The only <laughs> challenger that didn't go on the wet tyres was your championship leader, Ayagura, at his home Grand Prix. The general rule of thumb is if you're in the lead of the world championship, whatever your opponents do, you just do the same. So if you all fuck up, you all fuck up together. No one loses anything. You can maintain your championship lead, whatever it might be. You might lose or gain a few points here or there and you come back to fight another day and just see the weekend out. Igor has seen an opportunity here to make up points and basically just win himself the World Championship. It was so light, the rain, and the circuit had stayed dry enough that in my head, I'm thinking their thought process wasn't, oh, let's do the opposite of everyone else. It was probably just, it just seems dry enough to run slicks. Surely everyone's doing that. So they've just probably, I think they've just made the decision they thought was best. I don't think they maybe saw it as an opportunity to do one over everyone else, do the opposite of everyone else. Because you wouldn't do that if you're in the championship lead, would you? You'd, and such a big championship, you may as well, it was 40-odd points, wasn't it, going into this one. So you may as well just do what everyone else is doing and just play it safe. But I think they've actually just looked at it and gone, it's not that wet. And it doesn't look like it's going to, if it does rain anymore, it will be very light. And that many bikes running on the circuit is going to keep it dry enough to, you know, a dry enough racing line to run on. So I think rather than be like, oh, let's just, do the you know let's let's get one over everyone here i think they just thought why isn't everyone doing this that must have been it because you wouldn't take the risk i don't think if you did then fucking big gajon is well done you know but but yeah and then manu gonzalez is by the way manu gonzalez won the race's first ever moto two win congratulations manu really good ride from salach after a difficult season got himself a podium and he was emotional after the race and fair play to him he's had a tough season he he, he was very honest in his his interview saying you know the move to that team he thought i'm a chance to win a world championship i'm going to compete for the world championship and he's just been absolutely nowhere so emotional one for him i agree finished second in the end and i did say last week i thought this championship was done anyway at the 40 odd point lead with the challenges challenging eye being so inconsistent even a 30-point lead, I thought, was pretty safe. I can't see anyone being consistently good enough who's close enough to him in the points to actually take the title off him. So I thought this was done anyway, but it's absolutely done now. And then my other issue with this race was if you're someone in that situation, it was very light rain. It was very light rain. If you're someone in that situation and you usually run around 15th, 
bottom bottom few positions in the points or lower, if you're running around in twentieth a lot, why was half the field not on slicks? Just be like, look, this is my chance. This is it. There's only about four guys running slicks, and it's not that wet. Why is everyone like? Even if you finish, usually finish around you know tenth, or maybe every now and then you get a top ten, and you think, oh, you know, I think if I just push if in the right conditions, I can maybe get a podium or whatever, or a top five. Surely everyone who doesn't finish normally in the top ten, you're just like, run the slicks here. I know in that sense, you've lost your advantage because everyone's doing it. But why isn't that the mentality of everyone? If you see all the front guys like, oh, they're all going to run wet. You know, we think most people are going to run the wet. Just run the dry. I don't know why you're not in the slick tires there. If you usually come fucking 18th, why, why is it Ayu Gura is the one doing it? Anyway, this race uh, was very interesting without being necessarily that entertaining. It was entertaining early on watching the slick runners get through the field, but generally it was what it was. But it certainly had a story to it, this one, um, with Agura basically racking up the world championship now. So how many points clear is he now? Let's have a look. Yeah, it's a 60-point gap to Garcia. Now, Garcia is still second. He's not finished in the top what the top 10 for for six grand prix before that his best finish was a fourth in in silverstone fucking hell that's what i mean by the inconsistency of the challenges around him so even with a 20 point lead here igor over garcia i'd be like well he's he's clearly home because nobody else is like one of them might win a race or whatever and close the gap a little bit to him but none of them's going to finish consistently near the front like he does they all go and win a race and then they're fucking absolutely nowhere the week after kanet's been the most consistent since Silverstone, you know, to, as a challenger. But he's coming from so far back, he's still 72 points behind. So this goose is cooked. Moto3, David Alonso is your new world champion. It's his checks notes. Ninth win of the season. Is it the best Moto3 season you've ever seen? Obviously, you like to Pedro and stuff spring to mind. I can't remember many great, great seasons before that. There may have been some. I'm trying to think of Brad, Brad Binder. Is this the best is this the best you've seen? You can always look back and be like, who had tougher opponents and stuff? But And you might think this crop maybe, we don't know yet, but is it as good as maybe the crop Binder was up against, for example, or, or Pedro or whatever? You don't know. But just on pure what I'm seeing, the talent of the young man to get to the front, and let's say we assume that it is a decent crop of young riders that he's up against, your Viers and your Otolas and such. Is it the best Moto3 season you've seen from an individual? We can go back to one, two, fives and stuff as well if you want. Let me know. Yeah, he's he's done it again. It's just it's the same win over and over again. He gets to the front. He works his way. He sits in the pack. He's like, yeah, you guys do what you want. Works his way one by one through the field as it as it gets to the sort of the amount of laps to go that he wants to get to the front. He'll start making his way through, right? Because uh, he'll want to be in a certain position with a certain amount of laps to go, and then. There's a certain point of the race where he thinks this is where I want to take the lead. It's the reason it's so good is because it's almost like he's just deciding with. It's not like he's he's kind of deciding when to do it. It's not like he's sort of just always pushing to try and get to the front and he gets shuffled back and then he oh yeah and then eventually he works his way to the front. He's just like no no on this many laps to go I'm going to be third or around the top three. With this many laps to go I'm gonna I'm gonna to want to take to take the lead and see if I can break him. And he just does the same thing every week. Colin Vier followed him through the field if not a bit too slowly. So Via probably was the best chance. And he did look like he could have had the ability to pull that gap back a little bit if he had an extra couple of laps, maybe. It was finished half a second down in the end. As Alonso was going through the field, he was kind of following him, but it was probably a lap or two too slow to get through. He couldn't quite make his way through as quick as Alonso was to keep up with him. Now, if he was on his wheel when they both got to the front, we may have had a different challenge for Alonso, but he just wasn't able to. Adrian Fernandez was good. He's ended up third. Um, so hey, he's actually coming to form second half of the season in a big way. So he'll be looking to carry that through to the next season and see what he can do. Uh, but it's title over now. The race is being run and won. Uh, I mean, it was a good race, this. It was entertaining. There was, a, I mean, again, you always get your big group finished, don't you? So it was a group of, oh, what do you want to say? Did it go back to Munoz? Sort of eight. For Asato. Uh, yeah, for Asato. I'm looking at the amount of time. Yeah, they all finished within four seconds. So not really a big group. The main group was down to Yamanaka, I'd say. And yeah, look, I, there's not much to say about Moto3 this week. It, it's, it's, again, it's the same race every week. <laughs> it's really entertaining. Big group and Alonso wins it in the end. Just on Alonso, I mean, we're all very entertaining and unique, I'd say, um, title celebration there with his little mini bike. 
maybe a little hark back to his his first days on a motorcycle. So that was nice. More so, I think, in in the interview in the pit lane, and they were really rushing him to get through stuff because he took ages to get back, and obviously you got to turn it around to get Moto Twos on. So that you could see the guy trying to be like, no, no, quick, come over here, way, way, way yourself, way yourself. And now, quick, do your interview. And then he did a, he spoke f- for longer than you would normally speak in probably a, the pit la- the the Park Ferme interview. How old is he? Like eighteen or something. He spoke really, really well. It was very humble talking about, you know. And English is your second language. To to go on and be that eloquent, I think, with his little talk about, you know, say, looking himself in the mirror and being like, are you going to be a world champion tomorrow kind of thing? And talking about how emotional it got him before the race. Yeah, very likable young man. Very likable young man. Um, thought he, I thought he spoke really, really well at the end of the race and was, was quite humble about it, which was nice to see. And that's it for Japan. We've got a week off now before we head to the absolutely incomparable Phillip Island. There's nothing else like it. It's the best. The best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be kind of circuit for me. Biased, of course, is from where I'm from. But yeah, let me know how you're getting on with the early starts. I was up nice and early for this one. I woke up. I couldn't sleep that night, and I woke up at sort of half two and tossing and turning. I thought, well, I'll throw it on, and if I fall asleep, Moto3 was about to say, if I throw it on, and if I fall asleep, I fall asleep. End up watching all of them live. So that was great. It's going to be the same again for Phillip Island. I don't know if it's even worse for Phillip Island, to be honest, um, the Australian time zone, but we'll see. We'll see you on the next one. Have a good weekend off. Take it easy.